you out there watching probably know more than anybody that I spend a lot of time talking about the Reason Rack. But check the receipts. 99% of the time, I'm only talking about 50% of the rack. I don't often mention the other half of Reason, the back of the rack. And that's not by accident. You see, I never want to give people the impression that the only way to use Reason is by understanding the advanced modular cable patching that takes place on the back of Reason's rack. Reason auto-connects devices when you drag them in. So if you don't want to use patch cables, you don't have to. But in all that reassurance, I have overlooked another group. And that's people who may not be using cables yet, but want to use cables. Because, sure, Reason will auto-route cables for you. But the advanced stuff, the experimentation, the what the hell is happening and why do I like it so much? All that only comes when you flip the rack and take the signal flow into your own hands. The metaphor of the patch cable is an incredibly simple and yet incredibly powerful way to represent signal flow from device to device. Rather than rely on generic lists of inserts, which represent detached and isolated floating windows and require buses and aux sends to merge and split signals, devices in the Reason Rack all live side by side, and signals flow effortlessly between them, the same way that they do for guitarists on their pedal board, hardware synthesizer racks, the back of the real-world studio rack I have here, and even the same way that they do for your Uncle Gary's totally rockin' new home theater setup that he won't stop inviting you over to check out. A cable only has two ends. It goes from point A to point B, and that's it. And there's no uncertainty about that either. It's right there for you to see, or to grab and change if you want to. We get to the back of the rack either by pressing the tab key on our keyboard in Reason's standalone DAW, or clicking the flip rack button in the Reason Rack plugin. There are two types of cables you'll encounter on the back of the rack, audio cables and control voltage cables. We'll talk more about that second type later. Audio cables are the thicker looking of the two, and they carry, you guessed it, audio signals from device to device. Let's use Reason's automatic routing to see it in action on the backside. If I bring in an instrument, like the Parsec Spectral Synthesizer, and a quad note generator player atop it to generate a note pattern for us, we've already got the seed of an idea happening. And we could drag in audio effects to experiment with our sound, like maybe a quartet chorus ensemble, into an alligator gate, and maybe we'll roll off the top with a channel EQ. But that's just using the automatic routing. You can see the cables have connected themselves, from the audio output of Parsec to the audio input of quartet, onward from the output of quartet to the audio input of alligator, and from its main output down to the channel EQ. But what if we dreamed up something more advanced? What if we created different effects chains for each side of our stereo image, so that we ended up with a really wide stereo sound being treated differently between left and right? Now, there's a few ways we could approach this, but here's the plan I've come up with. Instead of this linear path where audio comes out of Parsec and runs through all my effects, and then comes back up to our plugin's output, or a mix channel in Reason Standalone, I'll instead send Parsec's audio signal into a splitter, so that I can send the two signals down different effects chains. Those two different audio paths will come into a summing mixer, and then that mixer will go back to my final output. That's the plan, let's put it into action. From the utility section, I'll drag in the Spider Audio Merger Splitter device. You can see that it's just a bunch of audio jacks, which, on one half, merges many audio inputs into a stereo pair output, and on the other half, it splits one stereo pair input into many output jacks. That's the side we want. Clicking and dragging from an audio jack like Parsec's left audio output puts a cable in our virtual hands, and we can now drag around to any available audio input we want to. In our case, that's the top input jack on the audio splitter device. Notice that when I arrive over it, it highlights red to let me know that I've found a possible connection. When I let go, you'll also notice that Reason has correctly predicted that I wanted to connect both the left and right cables. Now I can't drag a cable somewhere it isn't meant to go. If I try and drag from an output to an output, nothing happens. Also worth mentioning is that if I didn't want the right channel cable to auto-connect when I drag the left side, I could simply hold down the shift key while I drag, and we'll just get the one side connected. In my case, I actually do want both. Now we can drag one of the duplicate split signals out to that first effects chain we had set up, going to the input of quartet, out of quartet into alligator, out of alligator, and into the channel EQ. 
Unlike before, however, our final stop on this routing before it goes back up to our final output is to run it through a six channel line mixer. This is just a simple summing mixer that gives us control over level and pan to blend multiple signals. We'll drag cables from the output of our EQ to channel one of our mixer, and then cables from the master out of the line mixer back up to our final output. In Reason Standalone, this would be our mix channel input. After all that manual wiring and an audio splitter and a line mixer tossed in the rack, we have ended up, well, actually, exactly with the same sound as we had before. The big difference is that we can now pan that effect change signal over to the right speaker, and we can make a new set of effects to process the left speaker. So to set up for that, I'll click the minimize triangle on the effects I've already got in place to tuck them out of the way in my rack. Now I'll drag a couple more effects into the rack, but when I do, I'll hold down the shift key to disable Reason's automatic cable routing. Let's go with a rotor speaker effect, maybe a rack extension like Spio's Parafilter, and a synchronous beat repeater effect. We're ready to cable this up. We can tap off our signal from that same audio merger splitter device by dragging a cable from one of the other set of jacks down to the input of our rotor. And from there, we can cable the ins to outs like before, going from rotor to parafilter and parafilter to synchronous. And then this new signal chain will head back to our line mixer's second input channel where we can flip back around to the front and pan it to the left. The result sounds like this. which is a world of difference from where we started without all these effects. Instead of this string of notes coming at us from the center of the stereo field, we have this wide sounding interplay of textures and rhythms thanks to our first set of effects on the right, and our second set of effects on the left. And that leaves the center of our stereo image free and clear for things like drums. And maybe a bass guitar line to give our idea some clear direction. And, you know, even a vocal to turn this beat into a developing song idea. So as you can see, this type of routing is nothing Reason could do in its automatic predictive way, but with a little imagination, we can do it manually using patch cables and arrive at more advanced sounds. So that's audio cables, but like I said earlier, there's another type of cable in Reason's rack that becomes an ongoing exploration of experimentation and learning. I'll get us started with the basics today, talking about control voltage cables. But first of all, what is control voltage? Well. Control Voltage, or CV for short, was kind of like MIDI before there was MIDI. Early analog synthesizers used electrical voltage signals to send parameter control, pitch information, and gate trigger signals between hardware modules and other instruments. Reason, being a modular style rack with synthesizers, obviously had to include the ability to patch these types of control voltage between devices. But regardless of how it's labeled on the back of a device, be it pitch CV, curve CV, note CV, gate CV, all control voltage jacks in Reason transmit and receive just that, electrical voltage signals. Those signals can glide up and down slowly, or faster, or ramp up, step up and down, jump around randomly, and much more. They can be low amplitude or high amplitude, and each of these choices will impact the way that they modulate, which is just a fancy word for change, the settings on our devices. Let's start out by using a type of CV jack common on Reason devices called gate CV. Gate CV is used as a trigger signal. One easy way to visualize gate triggers in action is by combining two of Reason's drum machines to work together. Here, I have a Kong drum kit set up with a few unique sounds in ways only Kong can do them. I've got a kick drum that has layered samples, but it's linked with pad five, which adds a synthesized kick drum tone into the mix. 
my snare has some extra transient shaping to increase its attack, and I've got a filter across the master output which filters everything for a bit of retro color. Now, what if I want all these effects, the linked pads, and the synthesized bass drum, but I love Red Drum's step sequencer for programming beats? Well, I can have the best of both worlds with gate CV signals. I'll flip around to the back of the rack and just drag a Red Drum above my Kong while holding down Shift to disable auto cabling. And now I can drag CV cables from each gate out on Red Drum's channels to a corresponding gate in on Kong. So channel 1 to Kong Drum 1, channel 2 to Kong Drum 2, and so on for all six of the Kong drums that I have set up in my Kong patch. From there I can just interact with Red Drum directly in programming a beat, and instead of hearing sounds triggered internally in Red Drum, I'll be hearing the Kong drums, which are triggered as a result of the gate CV which is being sent out by Red Drum on each step that I've programmed in the sequencer. That's the musical result, but let's take a quick look at the actual electrical signals at work here so that it really starts to click. The gate signals coming out of Red Drum are only different from other control voltage signals in Reason in their duration. They're just super short blips of voltage, and that's all that's needed for the gate input of Kong to react and trigger its drum pad. Now, just conceptually, if we sent Kong a different type of voltage signal, not from a gate output, but from a continuous waveform known as a low frequency oscillator, or LFO, you'll see that essentially the same thing is happening, but now in slow motion. Instead of a super quick blip of voltage that Kong responds to when it immediately exceeds its trigger threshold, now our slow moving electrical signal feeds into Kong, and we can see that Kong still responds when that voltage exceeds its trigger threshold. If we speed up the rate of our LFO to quarter notes, well, now we've programmed a 4 on the floor kick using control voltage instead of gate CV in a step sequencer. Does that all make sense? I mention this because as you move forward in your own experimentation, it'll help to know that whether a CV jack is labeled gate or curve or pitch or mod wheel or whatever, it's all working with and responding to the same fundamental voltage signals. That's how I was able to just patch a continuous LFO signal into a CV gate input, and it still worked. You can bend the rules, because on the back of Reason's Rack, well, there are no rules. But so, that's gate CV. Then there's the curve modulation style of control voltage signals. These signals aren't about short transient gate triggers at all. They're about continuous signals which modulate parameters on devices. Yeah continuous signals which modulate parameters on devices. I mean, describing it in words makes it sound complicated, but it's not. I'll show you. Here I've got a monotone bass synthesizer being played by a pattern mutator line. In order to give this bass line a little movement and action, I'll drag in that same Pulsar dual LFO from the utilities that we just used in the last example briefly. Pulsar is a device that is purpose-built for generating these continuous control voltage signals I was mentioning, which, remember, we call LFOs or low-frequency oscillators. In fact, Pulsar generates two LFOs, hence the dual in Pulsar dual LFO. And on the back of Pulsar, we've got a bunch of inputs and outputs. If I drag a CV cable from Pulsar's first LFO section to the filter frequency CV input on the back of Monotone, we'll hear a wah-wah-style pulse right away, as Pulsar is now modulating our filter frequency cutoff. For the purposes of visualizing these signals with you today, I'm going to drag in an extra device, a scope rack extension from Electric Panda. By passing the CV signal through that, we'll be able to see the signals that Pulsar is generating. We have controls on Pulsar to choose how dramatic this filter modulation is, how fast or slow, and what waveform shape we want. Now those who are familiar with monotone, or synthesizers in general, might ask, why use Pulsar when there's a built-in LFO on monotone already? That's a good question. The answer is simply that Pulsar affords us some extra options. 
For example, I could drag another CV cable to simultaneously modulate the filter resonance. Or I could change that to come out of Pulsar's inverted CV jacks, which means that while my frequency cutoff CV signal is modulating up, the resonance will be modulating down. And I could also tap into Pulsar's second LFO. Watch. I'll set it up for a fast 16th note rate. Choose the random waveform. Dial back the level. Turn it on. That one's important. And now I could move the frequency cutoff cable over to the second LFO like this. Or I could actually use the combined output on Pulsar to send out one CV signal that's actually comprised of both modulation waveforms. We get a filter that is gliding up and down, but also bubbling along in the faster random style from the second LFO. And already we're doing things we just can't do using built-in monotone features, and all it took was a couple of patch cables. CV cables go a lot deeper from here. In fact, some people's entire journey with Reason, and synthesizers in general, is going further and further with what they can do with control voltage. But hopefully today, I've given you a primer that shows you the potential for Reason's cables to help you explore advanced sounds and techniques. And maybe most importantly, I've demonstrated that it's not complicated. It's not scary. In fact, it's the opposite. It's fun. So flip the rack, grab a jack, make a track, Windows or Mac, it won't be whack. You got the knack. Uh, try a sound pack. All right. I'm going to quit while I'm already behind, but let's go make some music, all right?